Okay. So for all our folks who can't be here today, and this is also for you. So today we're going to go over creative finance, how you can find these deals, right? I'm going to also share how we find these deals. And I'm going to also share with you uh, some of the things to look forward into these deals. What do these deals typically look like, right? So if you can, please mute your mic if you haven't already. I'll just hit mute. Oh. Um, if you have any questions, drop them down in the comments. Like I said, we will make sure we go over those. And once again, in the chat, drop where you're from and uh, let's get this show on the road. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down a list of places where we are getting leads from, okay? Now, a lot of these are going to be free but how are we able to find these creative finance deals? How are you able to find these creative finance deals? So these are some of the places that we look, right? So number one thing that we love is social media, guys. And it really is. It's, it's sharing with the world who it is that you are and what you do. So one of the things that we love to do is put on our, our, our very own social media that we buy houses and we pay $1,000 for referrals. And so if they have anybody who they know wants to sell a house, they recommend them to us we get paid $1,000. This list, guys, I'm going to drop it in our group. So you don't have to write this down unless you want to. But these are the things that we're doing. So everybody knows of bandit signs. And I'm going to go over the list of how we're getting these leads because it's more than just free leads, okay? It's more than just getting the leads coming to you. But I'm going to go over what we do. Um, but referrals are usually going to be one of your best ways to get leads. Um, driving for dollars. You know, when you see that house with the lawn and all the boarded up windows, things like that, door hangers, business cards, um, really what we're going to dive into are some of the creative ways. So some of these things that we're able to find are right on Zillow, right? For sale by owners. You're able to go onto Facebook Marketplace. I cannot believe how many times we'd reach out to people on Facebook Marketplace and they want to sell their house, guys. And there's an amazing deal just sitting there on Facebook Marketplace. Um, you can look on Craigslist, Zillow. Um, I really love expired listings with realtors. So the way the market has been the last few years, the market's been really red hot. You really haven't found too many expired listings, right? But what's going to happen is with this change in the market, I think we might start seeing more of those. And you're going to certainly start seeing properties where they've been in the market a lot longer. And just right before the Zoom call, I actually have one of my investor friends who lives in the Tampa area. He's an investor down there. And the text message he sends me says, this is a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood on, in Tamperin Springs, Florida, which is right outside Tampa. He says the seller of this house um, got a hold of him through one of his marketing. And they have been talking about creative financing. She's 100% open to it. She owes around 115 on the property. She, her payment's about $1,400. They're asking $550 for the property. It's listed right now with a realtor and it hasn't been selling. It's been on the market for 25 days. Um, I said, does she need a down payment? He says, well, she's moving to Pennsylvania and she wanted one, but she's okay with just getting enough of a down payment to buy her house in Pennsylvania. So this is a call now that I could get on with a seller who wants to sell their house and they're open to terms. So I'm going to give you guys a little asterisk of a really neat way to find seller finance deals in almost any market is you could reach out to a realtor and do a realtor search, believe it or not. And a lot of the MLS, they could search for seller financing available. So what happens is I've linked up with some realtors in the Tampa area, because that's where we're moving to. And just to see for either our own personal house or for an investment tool, what I looked at was send me any of the listings that have seller financing available. And sure as can be, I get five or six listings just in that one small little area of seller financing available. If you go under Zillow and you go under keyword for search and you put in owner financing and you hit search, look through that for, for sale by owner and through Realtor, and you're gonna realize there's a lot of folks out there who will take seller financing and they really, they put it right in the listing. So now some of them even put in the terms, but this is where me, I pick up the phone and I call, especially the for sale by owner, and I'm gonna ask them some of my magic questions as far as what do those terms look like, right? The price, the monthly payment, 
term length, down payment, really the big four things. And these are the things that we're going to talk about during those calls. So can you find them on the MLS? Yes, you can. The one challenge is when we talk about buying these creative finance deals is what's the cost of entry into the deal? So what I mean by the cost of entry, we add up, do we need a down payment? What are the closing costs? Are there any repairs? Do I have to pay a realtor commission, right? If it's on the MLS and all these costs add up. So when you add up those costs of acquisition, you have to see now if that deal's worth it or not. And that's going to make a big difference. So having that 6% commission in there can really, you know, in a half million dollar home, that could be $30,000, right? Entry fee just on that. But maybe the rest of the numbers make sense and that deal, you still go ahead and do it. But there are ways where you can find them right through Realtors, right on Zillow, just by putting the keyword, searching owner financing. Now, I'm sure I'm not the first person who's thought of that. I'm sure probably a lot of these for sale by owners are probably used to getting these calls. But you know what? That's the job is to call them because they have not all been called and there's new ones all of the time. <clears throat> the next thing that I really love doing too is I love working with wholesalers is almost one of my most favorite thing to do. So how can you get free leads? When we reach out to wholesalers, and this is where I'm going to get into next, is a lot of these deals with these creative finance deals, these are on properties where the numbers just don't make sense for these cash folks, right? The ones where they need to get a big discount in order for the numbers to work out. Or how about the one where it's just a turnkey house, like the one that I just have for my friend. This house is absolutely beautiful. It's a half million dollar home. It's a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood. The seller is moving to Pennsylvania and they're ready to leave. For any cash investor, that number won't work out because they need you know, close to full price for their home. But now for us, buying on terms, if I could buy a half million dollar home and I could take over a $1,300 payment, I'm sure I could probably rent that for quite a bit more and cash flow amazingly well, right? So on a lot of these terms, if the seller's a little flexible and when they get their equity, maybe they don't even have much equity, right? Sometimes we get a VA buyer who they roll in all of the closing costs, they roll in everything, and then they might get relocated and, and have no equity, right? So what do those folks do? And so for a lot of these deals where they have no equity, those are some of the our favorite, absolute favorite creative finance deals. So what I'm gonna go in all of these leads, all these free ways to get leads. I mean, you could spend money, do radio. You could spend money, hang bandit signs. You could do a lot of the different things. And I'll tell you what we do. We do social media. We do 100% Facebook. That's what we do. Um, we do Facebook marketing ads. Our cost per lead is really low. We're probably eight bucks a lead. Um, with that being the case, we're able to generate a fair amount of leads. <clears throat> there are students who get a lot of leads for free that you don't need to do this. And we get a lot of leads for free too. Um, <clears throat> Mike and Jay are some of our rockstar students. They might actually even be in here. They are, you can see their name there. They did uh, five deals in the last 30 days running free ads. Right, just saying, hey, we buy houses and doing some really good branding. That's what we kind of teach. Um, and it's really about branding yourselves personally rather than being the typical, hey, I buy houses people. So these are the, some of the big factors is we all are probably good at generating leads. But my whole thing is what do you do with these leads when they come in? And this is going to be some of the differences of how you're going to be able to buy and make creative finance deals. So when these leads come in, you know, we work on processing them pretty quickly because we have a big, big belief at our gen buys team. And the big, big belief is time kills deals. I mean, it is just, we constantly go over that. So when you have a seller reach out to you, if you're not responding to them pretty quickly, somebody else is going to. So you need to make sure that whoever's coming, who's handling your leads are handling them quickly. Okay. And then the next thing is, is you're going to ask them a series of questions to see if it's a good fit for them. And this is going to be the next step of the processing. A lot of folks are always going to ask, what's your cash price, cash price, cash price? Because when we're buying real estate, a lot of folks think that's the most important thing is just the cash price. In a lot of transactions, that's very important. But when we buy with creative financing, cash price to me is not the most important. And I'm going to go over a case study of uh, one of the deals my student just wrote this past week on a property in Ohio. The seller has a three unit available. He wants 150,000 for it. He has it listed on Zillow. He hasn't had it sold. My 
new student puts out his marketing. The seller reaches out to him and says, I want to sell my three unit. We start working about creative finance. He says, I've opened a seller financing. It's a free and clear property. So what we've worked out with the seller was he wants 150 for his property. It's probably worth 150 to 160, 175 tops. But he feels like if I get 150 for it, I'm getting a good price. But the way that we had the rest of the deal structured was that 150 price is going to be amortized over 30 years at a 4% interest rate with a balloon at 10 years. So what that does, that gives us a $668 payment. Plus, once you add the taxes and insurance, it's about 900, a little crack over 900 bucks all in. As current rents sit, I think he's renting it for $1,550 for all three units. So you're walking into a situation where the seller, they want $10,000 down. So when I'm looking at this deal and I'm analyzing it, the seller only needs $10,000 down. He's giving us a 10-year term at a $900 payment that I know that we could walk into cash flow without having to change rents. And the rents are all well under market value on a property that's turnkey and already fully rented. So this is a deal for us where the seller feels good about getting his 150 price, but we were able to get into the deal with $10,000 cash down, $3,000 for closing, $1,000 for insurance policy. You're into a deal for less than $15,000 out of pocket, and you're cash flowing five to $600 a month on a turnkey already rented property and with room to increase rents. And you have that deal for 10 years at a 4% interest rate. So this is where the seller feels great about his deal. He sold it. He feels great about getting $10,000 down. We feel good that we got into a nice turnkey property that's going to cash flow very, very well. And we have a long term on it, right? And we have room to definitely increase rent, a minimum of 100 per door on a three unit. So we've got room to grow, still being very conservative because we could have much more room than that. So we really focus on, there's so many different ways to kind of structure these deals, free and clear houses versus houses that have mortgages. Um, but however you're going to structure it, your process of asking these questions are going to be key, right? So where I'm going to dive into now are what do some of these sellers look like, right? Because we've noticed some things. So some of these things that I've noticed are a lot of these houses are pretty close to turnkey. They're the houses that all the other investors can't buy. But sometimes, for some reason, people don't want to sell them on the market. They don't want to list it with a realtor. And there's a million reasons why. Sometimes it's a convenience. Sometimes they don't want people going through their home. Sometimes it's a turnkey house that really is pretty nice. It just needs a clean out, right? Maybe it's just they got stuff everywhere. And they don't want their neighbors or their family members seeing what their house looks like. Sometimes they're overwhelmed with a recent move. And I'm selling my house and moving now. And when you live in the same house for 10, 15 years, you accumulate stuff. And you got to figure out what I'm doing with all this stuff. So making sure that we communicate with our buyers that we buy the property as is, that we can close when they're ready to close, because I'm not personally moving into the property. And we, what do you do with all of your stuff? I tell everybody the same thing. And our team does like take all the things that are important with you and anything you don't want, leave it behind and we'll take care of it. We'll either donate it or dispose of it. And if somebody were to reach out to me right now and say that, I would love that fact because I have a dumpster in my driveway. So my wife throws all the stuff out that we don't want anymore, right? So with that being the case, these deals are usually turnkey or pretty close to turnkey. There's usually sometimes free and clear houses, but you'd be surprised how many times there's very little equity. And those very little equity deals, I love those. So in a lot of times when people are doing mailers or they're pulling lists, they're looking for big equity. I actually look for folks who've owned a house less than five years, under five years, who want to sell, and especially if they own a house for less than five years and they now have moved out of state. So a vacant home owner less than five years, if you're going to pull a list, it's a great list to pull. No equity. Those are a fantastic list to pull because somebody might have just bought a home and then gets relocated, gets transferred, all types of reasons, right? They want to move. They have another property. Um, so no equity. A lot of times folks want to, they've already moved out of state or relocated and they have a pain point of they can't afford that other payment. I have that in a situation right now, actually with one of my students where they have somebody who had a property rented. The property now is vacant. The tenant moved out and the payment's like 17, 1800 bucks a month. Plus they have to pay utilities. So they're pretty motivated to sell because there's $2,000 a month 
that they're paying out of pocket. It's time to sell, right? So what is their motivation? Sometimes is that debt relief. So when we talk about all these different ways to find them, what's another way you guys could find deals? Right through us, okay? We also have found a lot of these deals. We find a lot of these leads that we filter with our team that we have, that we will negotiate the terms with the seller. Now, all of these deals, we can't close on ourselves. So a lot of these deals, we do assign to other investors, folks who are looking for these kind of deals, just like some of you. So I can't say it's super easy to find them, but you can. And there's sellers out there in tons of situations who really could use some help. But sometimes folks want to hit an easy button and that's where we're able to help you guys out with. So what does that mean? A lot of our deals that we have, if you go to favehomebuyers.com, you'll see our inventory on there. F-A-V-E, favehomebuyers.com. Our inventory is right on there, guys. So if you ever want to see what properties we have available, like we have one in Delta, Colorado right now. A lot of folks love Colorado. I didn't realize how big Colorado was. So this is on like further away from airports and things like this, but it could be a great long-term rental across the street from a school, half an hour to an hour away from, I think four or five different national parks. And when you look at these photos, I'm talking like mountains and absolutely stunningly beautiful. So it's a fantastic deal. Seller um, is the price we have it under contract for is 300,000. The ARV is about 350 on it. So you're walking into a turnkey 1700 square foot house across the street from elementary school that's just ready to go, right? So it needs a little bit of cash. And I think we have like a seven or eight year term on that. So for somebody who's looking in Colorado, like this could be a great deal. Maybe you want to do that for a rental. Some of these deals that we find um, could be a good Airbnb potential too. <clears throat> now what we do, just so we're on the same page, when I'm figuring out the numbers on a deal, I'm going to figure it out based on it being a rental. Just so if you decide you want to turn it into an Airbnb later on and regulations change or something, you don't want to do that, you know you're going to be able to fall back and have a money-making rental, right? But then also too, what we do and our team is we run an Airbnb report for you. Um, one of the team members on our team, she is an expert on it and we get all the information to figure out the occupancy rates in that area, the monthly um, I'm sorry, the daily rates, what it would be for this, even as far as this property compared to the rest of the market, right? In certain areas. So we kind of give you those reports, but this is something when we do is what's called underwriting a deal. We make sure we're very mindful of certain things can change. And if you decide you want to have it as a rental, um, I want to make sure that works for you guys too. So we definitely come with you guys with a lot of different properties on our private group, the um, Creative Finance Playbook with Jen and Joe. We're also going to display them on there too. We're going to make sure we get a lot more walkthrough videos if you're interested in seeing some of these properties. And you'll see Courtney, you'll see Diva. They work for us on our team. Those are our dispo managers. So if you see these properties listed in that group, this is what they're doing. If you see them, these are one of our properties that we are assigning out. So we're going to continue to share with you guys how we are finding these deals. We're going to continue to you know, go over all the tips and all the tricks that we're finding. And really what we've done recently, I don't know if many of you know, uh, Gary and Susan Harper from Sharper Solutions. Um, we hired them this past spring to come in and look at processes and they're really fantastic business coaches, but where they sit down with you guys and they really talk about process, process, process. And this is why once again, rather you're doing creative finance, rather you're doing wholesaling, whatever it is you're doing, they're all going to talk about the same thing as having a great process. So when we talk about these leads that you're going to come in, whether you're doing cold calling, rather you do pull lists, rather you do drive for dollars, right? And you have that seller's information and you're talking with them. The one thing that you always want to talk about is, hey, would you be open to seller financing if we could agree on price and terms? Right? And they might say, what does that look like? And this is where we start getting into scripts, right? This is where we start asking a handful of questions. We're collecting information. The one thing I do instruct all of my, my team, all of our students, especially when you're new to this, you guys have to remember something. You are the buyer. You are the one in control of buying. My old job, we used to be working in a dealership, right? And I can't imagine anybody walking into a dealership and saying, I love that RAV4. How much is it to a salesman? And the salesman says, I'm not telling you, just make me an offer, right? I would feel like that's kind of strange. So it's the same thing when you're dealing with folks who say, just make me an offer on my property, right? And a lot of folks do. 
And what I learned from my coach, Ron the Grand, is that if you start saying, you know, naming your prices, you insert foot in your mouth, right? So what he taught and his teaching is all about, and the same thing that we talk about, is how to ask the right questions and have the seller present you the offer. So a lot of the questions where I'm going to ask in the beginning are, can you tell me about your property? Why are you selling? How soon do you want to sell? Now, the rest of our script really is going to dive into financial questions. You know, does it need any work? What do you own the mortgage? What's the monthly payment? Yada, yada, yada. But the real meat of potatoes of the whole script is the first three questions, guys, right? The rest of it is just to collect information to help me structure the deal. But like, tell me about your property. And they tell you it's a three bedroom, two bathroom, 1500 square feet. You know, I bought it this long ago. Well, why are you selling? And they tell you their why. And once you find out what their pain points are, their why, why are they selling this? Why are they reaching out to you, right? Or why did you reach out to them? And they say, yeah, I'm interested in selling. What is their why? And that's going to be really, really helpful because once you've heard their why and I relocated from my job or I've, I've done this and that, and now you understand the property and you're realizing this is not going to work for a cash offer. This is the neat thing about what we do. I could offer cash at a discount. And I tell us the folks that there's lots of times where we could pay cash for a property. And if we do, it's because the property needs a lot of work and we get a really big discount. For folks who want top of the range, we could, we could stretch that way. And the way we can make that work is with seller financing is that once we agree on the price, we close on the property, we'll take over making your existing payments until I could get you cashed out and paid off down the road. Until then, we take care of the maintenance, the repairs, utilities, all that, so you're free to walk away. Now, some people might say, well, Joe, I might need some money now. And that's where we get into, you know, we typically buy with no money down. So if I were to give you a down payment, what's the least you'll need? I'm asking a question. I'm not saying I'll give you 10 grand down or 20 grand down. And for an example, we had one today. She, she did some repairs to a property and she had seven grand on a credit card. She's, she wants the seven grand to pay off her credit card. So, okay, if I buy your property at this and I give you that $7,000 down and I agree to take over your payment, does that work for you? I'm confirming that with them. If they say yes, great. We start working the term length. We get all of it set. The terms, the four pillars of what we talk about, price, down payment, monthly payment, term length. Once we figure out those four, we put that in writing. Everything looks good on our end. It looks good on their end. They okay it. We send it to attorneys and we close the deal, guys. There's a little bit more to it than that. I will be honest with you. Uh, we do have a transaction coordinator on our team named Chelsea. Chelsea is one that she is worth her weight in gold because she helps now once that deal's in her contract. She chases down the attorneys to make sure that closing's going well, gets all the proper disclosures and documents and mortgage statements and mortgage payoffs. We're coming up with a whole list of all of the things that once we have it finalized, we'll also share it with you guys that when you make these creative finance deals, here's a checklist of everything that you're going to want to get. And that checklist just keeps growing all the time, right? But we want to make sure I have a mortgage statement. I want to make sure I have a mortgage payoff. Right. I want to make sure everything lines up correctly. And I'll go over, everybody loves hearing great stories, but I'll give you a bad one. Okay. Give you one that a deal that blew up because you know, and they do happen from time to time, guys. There's nothing's ever perfect. We had a deal recently where a seller tells us I owe three hundred and thirty thousand dollars on my mortgage. He takes a screenshot from the app from his phone, says, Here it is, I owe three hundred and thirty thousand. There's his name, there's the property address, there's his mortgage balance, three hundred thirty thousand. He says, If I walk away with 20 grand you guys could take over my mortgage. So we said, fine, if I buy your house for 350, we have a deal. He says, yes. Okay, good. Everything looks great. We line up our buyer to buy it for that price plus our assignment fee. Buyer's already ready to go. We get a mortgage payoff. And I don't know how the app showed 330, but when we got his mortgage payoff, his balance was 360,000. There's a $30,000 swing. That means you know, everybody else had to move. $30,000 that blew up the deal, right? So what do we learn from this mistake? Once we make the deal, we get a mortgage payoff. And I wanted the most recent statement right then and there. There'll be a slight difference, but they should be pretty darn close, right? So these are the small things that we constantly will work on and create a checklist for you. So when you do make one of these deals, you have all the right documents you need to make sure that you're doing it properly, right? You don't want to find out at closing number numbers are way off and all of a sudden the deal is going backwards. So I'm also going to kind of go over another strategy. Um, if anybody has a chance, you could go to favehomebuyers.com. I'm going to pull up a property real quick. 
So we had a property that was available in Louisiana, Greenwood, Louisiana. And I'm gonna kind of go over a quick situation of how we were able to turn a deal into a win. This property is a manufactured home. It's a four bedroom, two bathroom. It's about 2,500 square feet. The seller is willing to sell this property on sub two. They need $7,000 down to walk away. They're selling to us for $70,000. So $7,000 down, a couple grand in closing costs, you're into a deal for $10,000 out of pocket. We had this for available online. Nobody jumped on it. So I tell the seller, don't worry, we'll buy it because we're going to sign it. I didn't really want to buy a property in Louisiana, but that's fine. So we buy the, we're going to be closing this property. I call up a realtor because I looked at some comps in the area and one that's on the same street that just sold for 83,000 was the same thing. It needed a bunch of work and was 1600 square feet and that sold for $83,000. So I knew I was in a good spot on ours. So all we did is I reached out to that realtor and I said, hey, Mr. Realtor, say that you just were part of this transaction, just closed. I'm buying this manufactured home. I'm closing it in two or three days. I'm just gonna clean it out and I'm gonna list it right away. It's gonna need work. Here's the address. Here's a walkthrough video. He says, I think you'd get 100,000 for that property all day long. And I already got buyers who will take it. So I explained to him, well, maybe I don't wanna double close on it maybe that your guy just wants to buy it and pays me an assignment fee. So he says, good, I will let you know right away. So this is a situation where for us, I can buy this deal for a total of $10,000 where I have 3,000 for closing costs, pay the seller their seven grand so they could walk away. Now I owe the bank 63 grand. I could just take out some of the belongings inside of it, just do a clean out and list it with him for a hundred grand on the market. And after I pay his 6% commission, if I decide to go that route and some closing costs, I'm going to be somewhere in the short 90s. And what do I have really out of pocket in the short 70s? So you can make $20,000 within just a matter of a few weeks by doing that. I could also stay in the deal if I want to in cash flow, right? So I have that option too if I want to turn into a long term property because my monthly payment is only like 500 bucks a month. So I know I could rent it for double that. So do I want to be a landlord? Do I want to do a lease purchase on the exit strategy and put in a rental and buyer? Or do I want to just get in and out and make 20 grand? You got a lot of different options, right? So sometimes I love to flip these houses to where we buy them on terms, do a quick, quick clean out and list it with a realtor. Sometimes it's an easy exit strategy for where I'm able to close on a house for three grand. Um, so Melissa, that's a very good question. Um, how do you stay in the deal for the seller finance deal to wholesale it to a new buyer? So all I would do is if I'm going to wholesale that, it would be a cash transaction to the buyer because these folks are wanting to pay cash for the property. So what I've explained to my realtor, that house is probably worth 150 to 160 done. Had a new roof. The inside of the video just needs a good clean out and you know maybe some updating here or there. Nothing too crazy. Um, the one that they bought for 83,000, they put 15,000 worth of work into it and they sold it for 130. And that was a 1600 square foot. This is almost a, a thousand square feet larger. So we got some wiggle room on here and I know that they're gonna be able to make money on this deal. So can I buy this and turn it into generational wealth by turning into a long-term cash flowing property? Cause these folks are just walking away. I sure can. Um, or do I want to make $20,000 and be in and out of a deal quickly? I can do that too. So this is why we love creative financing because when you make a deal, there's so many different options. So what we focus on on every single deal is when I'm making it, what's my first exit strategy? What's my second option for exit strategy? And what's usually my third? And I'm going to have a couple different ones, right? So on this one, um, we're going to be closing on it hopefully in a couple of days. And then either we're going to list it with the realtor right away. I still haven't decided if we're going to turn into a long-term thing, but I'll figure it out, I'm sure. Uh, and that's the challenge, guys. We run into so many deals in so many places. Like, how many states do you want to own properties in? Um, so that's why a lot of these, we assign them. So if you want to find more deals like this, definitely check out our site. But also, too, I want you guys to give me a shout out as far as would you like me to do more deal breakdowns, right? Would you like to see, like, hey, here's a deal we recently did. And here's the breakdown of how we made that deal happen. Because sometimes it's just seeing the deal 
of how one worked, the ins and outs of it, is sometimes that lesson that gives me the aha. So write a comment down below if you think that I should be maybe getting like one of our recent deals and saying, guys, like this is where the lead came in. This is the questions we asked. These were the responses they gave. And then this is the extra strategy that we did on that deal, right? So I definitely think that the extra strategies are important because the more extra strategies you have, the more opportunities you're gonna to have to make deals. So yes, I see the whole structure of the deal. Definitely, yes, um, have your team. Does your team have seller deed the properties to you? Does your team have sellers deed the property to you? Yes, they do. Uh, to answer your question, Chris, so if we buy a property on a wrap mortgage or seller finance, that deed goes to the buyer. So if that's us buying it, then we own that deed, right? On a property where we assign that to another investor, that goes to that investor. So if I get a real good deal under contract, say for an example, in Port Charlotte, Florida that we have right now, one of our investor friends reached out and said, I'll take that deal. We assign them that deal. They give us a little bit of assignment fee. They're going to pay some closing costs, the cost of entry into the deal. Now they have a, a money-making deal. So really what I want to do is I want to spend more time because I can see it's pretty popular. What we'll do is I'm going to do this every Tuesday, guys. Two o'clock is my goal. So Tuesday two, what I'm going to do is I want to really going to break down how we structure some of these wrap mortgages. Um, I'd like to know the question you ask when structuring a wrap. Um, so what I make sure I do, guys, I don't get into any of the technical investor terms when I'm talking to a seller. If I start saying that I'm going to buy your house with a wraparound mortgage or a subject to, or I start getting to too many of these technical things, you almost start talking above them. And I don't want to ever seem like I'm doing that. So I really try to want to break it down to the peanut butter and jelly to where, and I'll give you a good example. We have one that I did not long ago. The seller, we bought it for 290. They owe 230, 60,000 of equity. I said, so if we agree on that 290 price, I'm going to buy your house for 290. I'm going to close on it with attorneys. I'm going to take over making your existing mortgage payment to Wells Fargo, which was $1,700. And I'll make that payment. And inside that payment is the taxes and insurance and all that. And I'll make that payment every month until I could get you cashed out. And until then, the sale is done. You have $60,000 of equity. And some folks will give me 20 to 30 years to get them cashed out. Some will give me a little bit less. What's the most amount of time you'll give me? He says 30 years is fine. I write up for 30 years. I've got 30,000 or 30 years to get him his 60,000 of equity. So what I did was he has his 230 balance plus 60 on top of that is 290. So I make one piece of paper that wraps around all of that with his payment, which is on the 230, which is $1,700 a month. So it's really just having the lawyers do what's called a wrap where they're wrapping equity and principal into one new mortgage, but still keeping the old payment um, but when you explain that to a seller, that starts to get confusing. So I just explained to them that I'm going to buy your house for 290. I'm going to take over your $1,700 payment. I'm going to make that until I get you cashed out. You're going to have X amount of equity. How long are you going to give me to get that? Once we kind of discuss those terms, that's what I put in writing. I explain it to them again. I make sure they're very, very crystal clear. Everybody says, yes, they give it the blessing. We send it to the attorneys. Once the attorneys do all of that, they're going to go over the same thing to make sure they've had somebody else explain it to them. Everybody's on the same page. We're good to go. Um, so I hope that answers that. So I don't really tire, like say I'm buying it with a wraparound mortgage because they're going to say, what's that mean? So if I talk to some of you or investors talking and I explain wrap mortgage, we'll understand that. It's a little bit more technical terms. Um, but when I'm talking to sellers, I try to keep it very plain. So I make sure it's crystal clear to them that I don't say things that they might not understand. Um, so I'd never say technical stuff I don't even say I'm an investor. I usually say I'd like to buy and sell that area. Um, so that's that. So doing a walkthrough of a recently sold, good shape, agreed. Look closely at the Greenwood, Louisiana place. Would be interested in offer a walkthrough options of property you currently have available. Yeah, definitely get over to uh, Courtney Bo if you are looking for some deals because we got them I and we got a lot more coming. Um, what is the normal due diligence period to inspect a property after getting under contract? Give your buyers time to inspect the property. So what we do, Eric, is when we have a, especially one of our creative deals under contract, we do it for 14 days. 14 days, that gives us enough time to make sure that we've 
possibly attracted a partner on that deal. Maybe it's another partner who's going to put it into their LLC. Maybe it's one of our LLCs. Because sometimes when we're closing on a property, I might not even know what LLC it's going to go into yet when I make that initial deal. Sometimes that LLC might be farming still, right? Some of it might be a land trust that we put them into. So long story short, I do a 14-day due diligence period on our end. And what we tell our sellers is that we're going to make sure that we're doing all of our due diligence and that we might be showing this property to some partners and contractors. And that gives us the 14 days to make sure that we could find the right fit for that property. Um, level walkthroughs, newbie question. Are you able to pull equity out of a home that is under seller financing since it's not written with a bank or leveraged in any other way for down payment other than the property? So I get a property seller finance opportunity. So exactly to answer your question, Luke, um, our lien is still filed with the county. So for an example, even on a free and clear house, or that wrap mortgage is still going to show that we bought it for 290 for 290 and that we owe the seller 290. It might not be a mortgage recorded with say Wells Fargo, but it is a mortgage that is technically recorded with the county. Still to answer your question, you can still pull cash out of a deal if you wanted to refinance it if you have equity in it. It's still your property technically. Um, you can do that. Um, to answer that question. Um, any other questions that we have in here? So you're not paying 60K amortized over 30 years. That is correct, Mike. I don't pay, when a seller has equity in a deal, if we're gonna give them any money, which I generally don't, it's usually a down payment, because what I don't wanna do with any equity that they have, I don't want that cutting into my monthly cash flow, because that monthly cash flow is gonna be imperative for me to be able to make the rest of that deal work, because if I'm gonna buy a property, I need to make sure I'm cash flowing on it. Now, if I have equity in the deal and I'm making a second mortgage to them, to the seller, um, that could really eat into that. So for me, if they have equity and they want to get that equity sooner or later, rather than me giving them monthly, instead of giving me a 30-year term, why don't I just get you cash out in full in 10 years, right? I'd rather shorten that term for that 60,000 rather than making another 350 payment to them over the next X amount of years and then me not making very much cash flow. So also too, I'll be quite honest with you, there's some times where people just don't care, but if they do need a down payment, I always say the same thing. I typically buy with no money down, okay? And if they say I need a down payment, well, if I do put down a small down payment, what's the least you'll need? And they might say, I need X amount for that. And, and I write that down. So if I give you $5,000 and I pay your price, you know, do we have a deal? And then I get into the term length question. Now, for some folks who need all the money, I'm not saying that you can't write that second mortgage. You can, but that definitely eats into your cash flow. And then what happens is if you bought it at a different price than what they had it currently assessed at, and your property gets reassessed, or you might lose like a, a homeowner exemption. Like in New York, we have what's called a star exemption, which you get a discount off your taxes. So now that you're, it's not owner occupied, you might have a slight increase in your payment. And this is why I'm a big proponent of having a lot of wiggle room in your monthly payment. So when you do buy a house on terms, maybe that house was assessed for 200 because that's what they bought it for, but I bought it for 375. The town comes in and reassesses it later on. Now I have an adjustment in my taxes and maybe I, I lose homestead ownership because I'm not, I'm now an investor owning the property versus somebody living there. My payment can increase. And so now if I have that second mortgage to a seller for some of their equity and I had an increase in taxes, you could be in a negative situation quickly. So I'm a really big proponent of protecting my monthly spread because if I can get into a deal where I'm not having to come up with a lot of cash, I want to do that on ones that are cash flowing, right? And those are my favorite ones. So property that I get into without a lot of cash that are cash flowing are my favorites. Price is important, not everything. Term length to me is very important. Right, I could buy a house for full price. I could even pay a little bit over, especially if they cash flow for a really long time and I have a long length to do it. Right, So I can make up that price over time. But if I got to get them cashed out quick, that puts a lot of pressure on you. So when I'm analyzing deals, there's so many variables that can change. So to let you all know, we're working on it on our team as a creative finance calculator to where you can start changing days and months and years and numbers um, and a lot of different things that we could look at there. The number two thing, guys, I'll say that you could all do, I'm going to drop it in our group. I think we already did, actually, so I don't even need to. It's already in there, is our cost of acquisition worksheet. 
you should pull that up. And so when you're talking with the seller and you should fill out that worksheet because your cost of acquisition is everything. Your cost of acquisition, if it's too high, you can't buy the deal. So what does cost of acquisition mean? When I talk to a new investor, they say, I have a sub two deal I want to assign you. I ask, what's your cost of acquisition? And if they don't have an answer, I know they're new. So cost of acquisition is that seller needs a 10 grand down payment. Put that in there. The cost of acquisition is I need 4,000 for closing. Put that in there. Cost of acquisition is they need a new furnace for three grand. Put that in there. And cost of, you know, and we'll write that in there. I already have it done for you guys. Go get it. So when you figure out these deals, add that stuff up. Um, it's super important. Um, do you have sellers add the buyer to insurance policies as additionally insured, or do the buyers open up their own insurance policy? Chris, that is a great question. I've heard it done both ways. So I've actually talked to my coach, Ron Legrand, who does it, and I've talked to insurance agents who've done it. And the way we've always done it from day one is that we have our insurance policy because what I've been told is that the seller no longer owns the property anymore. The deed's not even in their name. So you being insured or additionally insured on their policy, I don't know how well it's going to work out, but I do know insurance companies hate paying claims. So I don't want to give them any loopholes not to pay a claim if they ever had one to pay, right? Because I've had a house fire at one of my properties before. So the big thing for me is I have an insurance policy under my company for that property, and I have the seller as additionally insured on our policy with their new current address. And that's exactly what we do. So do I have an insurance policy with that address and the seller on there all together? Sure do. Is the bank okay with that? They sure are. So that's what we do. I've heard other people say that they add the buyer to the seller's insurance policy, but my only concern is the seller doesn't own that property anymore. So how good is that insurance policy? I'm the owner. The insurance policy is under my name or my company. However, that's what I do. And I make sure that the sellers on there is additionally insured. And this is an advice I've had from several between insurance pros and investor pros. That's what everybody seems to say, but I have heard it done the other way. I just don't, it just seems weird to me. So I never, I don't have any experience doing it the other way. Um, are you worried about loans being called due similar to 2008 situation? I am not worried about loans being called due at all. Um, in 2008, they weren't calling them due for this stuff. They weren't. Now, if loans being called due is if you're not making payments, um, there are ways to get a, away from that too. Um, so there's situations where if a loan does get called due, which once in a small you know, blue moon, a small credit union could have that happen or a bank. You know, most of these times, if the bank's getting their payment on time and the insurance is set up properly, you will run into most likely zero issues. But if you do run into a small lender who does have that happen, there's a lot of things you can do. You can deed the property back to the seller and have them sell it to you on a land contract or deed for sale. A lot of folks don't love that because they want to control the deed. The sale is done, but the seller holds the deed until paid in full. So I've purchased the property, we've agreed on the price, it's closed, but the seller still retains the deed until the property is paid in full. So now the bank cannot call the loan due, but the sale is still done. Or I could buy that on a lease purchase, which I don't like to do, but I have done, so I'm not opposed to it, but I still like to control the property if possible. But if I buy it on a lease purchase, I can also do that too. And the way I would structure the lease purchase is that my buying price is the mortgage balance at the time of the execution of the option. So what that means is by this is if I buy a house for what the seller owes on it, like a sub two, and at the time they owe 85,000, and in six years I pay it off and they owe 60,000, well, my original price only said 85,000, so that's what I'm technically paying for it, right? But if I write as my purchase price, if everybody follows me here, then my purchase price is the um, loan balance at the time of execution of option. That means if that balance is 63,000, that's what you're going to be able to uh, buy it for once it's time to execute that. Next level stuff if you didn't catch it, but if not, I'll go back to that another time. Um, so last question, I was under the impression you cannot do a sub two with a VA loan. Uh, yes, you can. You can definitely do them with VA loans. And those are popular with VA loans because um, a lot of times those folks will have zero equity. Challenge with a VA loan is if they're going to qualify for another VA loan, 
they might not have enough VA credits. So what does that mean? Um, VA pulls your information, they find out you could qualify for up to $400,000. And so I'm in an area, I look for a property and I only borrow $300,000. That means I have $100,000 of VA credit left. So if I go to relocate and I wanna buy another VA loan, then I might not be able to get that unless I have enough of those VA credits of that, if that means, if you understand what I mean. Um, you skipped me again. Oh man, I have to go back up and find out where that was. And create a finance deal where you pay the seller a sum and they walk away. What kind of paperwork would the seller give to you to be able to just take over payments with the bank since they don't hold the deed as of yet? So what they do is once we close on a property, we do get their mortgage statements. We get their mortgage payments. Um, we get... Um, authorization to contact the bank through there's a various forms we have in disclosures that we can communicate with the bank without having the seller do that uh, power of attorney things like this and then what we do is once we have that account number you could do a series of things if you can get a service company involved which is a third-party company where you give them the information and they will suck the payments from your account and they will make those payments for you you can set up to your automatic payments at your own bank so how on some of our deals I have the mortgage statement that comes to me. The payment's 900 bucks a month. I have the account number, all this. And through my bank, I have that sent automatically to their bank. And their bank will just accept the payments. They will process it because it has the payment amount, has the account number, has all the stuff on there. And they do that. So really, as long as I have their account number and all the bank information, that's all I really need to make their payments. Um, and that's how we do that. I hope that answers. Um, cool. Any other questions, gang? Well, I'll tell you what, what we're gonna start doing is we're gonna start talking about some deal analyzing too. Um, so you'll pay them an additional 60K in a lump sum eventually? Yes, we will. So what will happen is Mike, on that question, that one property, what we will do is I've got 30 years to give them their 60,000. So generally what I've got is I got 30 years now, sometimes they're not quite 30, right? So if I've got equity in any deal, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, whatever it is, um, I can put in a, a lease purchase tenant buyer. Now, I love that because I could put in somebody who's going to rent it on the property and then they're going to qualify for a mortgage down the road and then they're going to pay rent. And then when they do, everybody gets paid off. And if I have a 30 year term like I did on that property, my tenant buyer that I put in there, I'm in no hurry to get them cashed out, especially because my payment's only 1,700 bucks a month to the bank and I rent that for 3,000 a month. So I'm cash flowing 1,200. So I hope they don't cash out for a really long time, especially because I have a 30 year term on that property. But sometimes it's not always that great, right? So somebody says, I gotta get cashed out in five years. So I have one in North Tonawanda in Buffalo. The seller says, I need to get cashed out in seven years. So with that being the case, when I screen my tenant buyer for that, because we always have them screened, they are about a two year turnaround time for credit and things like that. So in the next two years, they're going to be living there, renting all this. Now, if they go over a year or two, sure, can I let them stay in there a little longer and then get them refinanced? I could. But now, what if I'm just going to be a landlord? I could rent that. I could just rent it if I wanted to in cash flow. I could sell it at any point or I could refinance out of it, but I don't like refinancing and putting debt in my own name. So chances for me, I would either sell that to my tenant buyer or I would more likely um, partner with somebody if they if I really truly wanted to keep it. Or you could go to a bank. Um, after someone pays you an assignment fee for a seller finance deal, how do you ensure that the buyer makes the monthly payments to the seller? Most of that is a great question. So what we do on our end, there's never a guarantee it's going to happen. So what we make sure we do is we heavily screen the buyer. We make sure that the seller and the buyer approve of each other. If this is some buyer who's gonna be living in the property, what we do is we call it it's, um, an RMLO, which is basically a, a mortgage originator where they would run on you to see if you'd qualify for a mortgage. So it's basically, it's a heavily screening to see if what you would qualify, what it looks like. And the reason why that's important is because I don't wanna put somebody in a property who makes $25,000 a year and they're trying to buy a half million dollar property. I know they can't pay it. I know they can't afford it. So, but maybe they got no car accident, right? And they got a 50 grand down payment. That'd be crazy for me to still put them in that 
that property, knowing they can't afford it. So um, what I would do if you're interested in that, Jamar, um, there is an attorney. I dropped his information in our group. His name is uh, Scott Horn. He has, and everybody has them in different states. So you'd want to look up what state you're doing business in and uh, look up our MLO and you'll find out companies that do it. The charge is about $1,000 to 1200 bucks. Typically, we don't pay that. Our buyer does. That's part of the closing costs. Um, so now to answer your question, Melissa, if it's somebody who's going to live in the property, we have one of those reports done. We show that to the seller. The seller says, okay, I approve of these people. It looks like their debt to income is aligned. It looks like they could afford the property. It looks like we're good to go, right? Now, what if this is an investor trying to buy this property? Because we have a lot of that, guys. So this is an investor trying to buy this property. What I want to do is I want to see, have you, A, bought a sub two deal before? We actually have a whole checklist of stuff that we ask you. So have you bought a sub two deal before? Do you have proof of HUDs showing that you have, right? I want to see that. I want to also see when you're going to be funding the deal, where's your EMD coming from? Is it coming from you or is it coming from a lender? When you're funding the rest of the deal, is that money coming from you or is that coming from a lender? We need to know where it's coming from. We verify all that information. So now if they've passed the test and they've owned rental properties or they already own many, they've bought sub two deals or maybe they haven't. I want to know a good about what my buyer is because part of my responsibility is if I'm going to link up a buyer and a seller, I want to do my due diligence to make sure that I'm putting the right combination together because I really want to, before I put somebody into a bad spot, I'd rather blow up the whole deal and not do it at all, if that makes sense. So we really want to make sure on our end that we are putting the right buyers into that situation. So when I'm working with an investor, we want to make sure that they are a legitimate investor. If I'm working with somebody who wants to be a homeowner, we run the background check on them. The seller says we're good either way. But it's not easy. You really have to do your due diligence. So all of these things that we're doing in our business, the checklists that we're coming up with, we'll continue to evolve them and then share them into this group for you guys. So if you are in a situation where you do have that happen, pull out the checklist, run through it, making sure you got all your stuff covered. And that's really the name of the game is full disclosure to everybody and transparency. And that is really what's key in this business is you make sure also you're dealing with an end buyer, Melissa, not somebody who's going to try to sell that deal to somebody else. You have to make sure it's an investor. If they're going to buy it, that they are the actual end buyer buying that deal for themselves. Um, and if it's a homeowner, you know, it's a different situation because they're planning on living there. So cool. Um, had a buyer fall through. He couldn't get a loan since he already had many open loans and his lender at the time learned a lesson. Yeah, I'll tell you what. This is why what we find out is when our buyer says, I'm going to put down cost of acquisition is you know $25,000. My assignment fee, closing costs, and maybe whatever. I want to know where that $25,000 is coming from. And one of the questions that we asked Jamar is, are you waiting for any other properties to close or any loans to clear before you have the money to fund this deal? Because you'd be surprised how many guys and girls out there, one, you know, they, they'll, they'll have, you, they tell you they have the money and then later to find out, well, they're waiting for X, Y, Z to happen. All these dominoes have to happen in order for them to have that money, right? And well, you know how that goes, money doesn't show up. So as far as a buyer goes, if you do, I always make sure I want to know who's funding that deal. And then if they say, um, here's my proof of funds and it comes through Joe Schmo's account, well, I want Joe Schmo's phone number, email address, and name. And I'm going to call Joe Schmo. I'm going to say, hey, Joe, you realize that you're going to need to fund this deal X amount of dollars by this date because so-and-so gave me your information and said, you're funding this deal. Are you knowing this is happening? And if they say, yes, I do, we do deals and this is what's going on, great. If they say no, so-and-so just asked me for a copy of my checking account. They didn't say why. And I just gave them a copy of it. Then we know that that deal is really not going to fund because that funder has no idea, right? So these are a couple of the things that we do. Uh, Follow-up question, when the seller cancels their insurance policy in a state yours, does the bank ever throw up a red flag? Yeah, they sent out this letter. Scares the heck out of everybody. Oh my God, your insurance. And then we send it to our insurance lady. And the insurance lady sends over proof of insurance and the bank goes away. Everybody sees the letter and they freak out. And my wife and I have been doing creative finance since 2016. And when she gets them, she still freaks out. But she's less freaked out by them now because we get them. Especially when you have a lot and then they all switch. It's a lot going on. So, but either way, guys, um, yeah, if you do have that, just get that to your insurance professional. 
and let them know that you need to get proof of insurance over to the lender ASAP. Make sure it has the seller's name on it as additionally insured and their new current address where they're currently living. It's got to be on there. So once you have that and you send it to the bank, you're good to go. So cool, gang. Um, next Tuesday, 2 o'clock, we're going to go over the same stuff. What I'm going to do is I'll go deal with some deal breakdowns, okay? How these deals are working. If you have any questions in the meantime, drop them up in that group. We're going to be here for you guys to continue to show you how we're able to do these things and really give back to the community because that's what we're starting this for is because, and I keep saying this, I'm going to teach you how this stuff works. So then A, you can make your own deals and then B, maybe even buy some of our deals. We had the deal in part Charlotte that actually one of our investor friends who they've came to a bunch of our master classes. They actually had us on one of their podcasts. They learned about what we're doing. And then we had this deal available. She's like, I want it. Now she's actually turned into, you know, buying a sub two deal and had rentals, but now looking for this. So same thing goes for you guys. We're going to teach you how to find your own deals, but also too, if you want, we're also going to have some of our deals available too. So until next week, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope that you got a lot of value here. And uh, if you, if you need anything else in the meantime, drop them in the group and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. If there's any topics that we want to go over, let me know. And we'll, we'll make sure I, I go on those too. So have a great week guys. We'll see you then. Bye.